From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Ted Nisi. Tim White is off this week. Later on in the show, we're going to talk to RIPAC CEO Mike DeBiase about the yawning budget deficit Rhode Island is facing and what he thinks needs to be done to deal with that. But first, a conversation with Dr. Ashish Shah. He is a top coronavirus expert in the nation and a Harvard University professor. He is also, as starting September 1st, going to be the dean of Brown University's School of Public Health. Here's that conversation. Dr. Shah, thanks you so much for joining me. I know what a busy man you are these days. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Let's start, um, I wanna start at the absolute most basic level here, watching the numbers in different parts of the country, our experience in the Northeast versus the South and West, it can be very confusing for people. Um, we're taping this on Thursday afternoon, but our viewers will generally be watching over the weekend. How would you describe the current state of the pandemic in the United States as of today, July 9th? Yeah, so, you know, what you have is a tale of multiple stories, and I would argue in some ways two stories. One is a large chunk of the country that is experiencing very bad outbreaks um, across much of the South, parts of the West, and even in some parts of the Midwest. Uh, and then large chunks of the country that's actually doing very, very well uh, here in the Northeast, uh, parts of the Midwest. And if you average it all together, uh, it doesn't look so bad, and the death rates don't look so bad, and the cases don't look terrible, but it completely misses the real underlying picture, which is a good half to two-thirds of the country is in real trouble with very, very large outbreaks. So when we look at these other states that you're talking about in the South and the West that are experiencing these real outbreaks, a lot of us have family and friends down in those parts of the country. What's striking to me is that what seemed to really crush the epidemic up here in Rhode Island and Massachusetts and New York were those really aggressive stay-at-home orders, especially for the month of April. Doesn't seem like that's the direction they're going to go in politically down there. So what, what is going to, to stop the epidemic from spreading so quickly in these states if, they, if, they, if that's off the table? Yeah, so I still am worried that most of these states are not taking this uh, pandemic seriously enough, and they're not taking their own outbreak seriously enough. So first of all, they absolutely need a universal masking order, and they need to really enforce it. So anybody, when they're out and about, especially in the indoor spaces, people need to be wearing masks. Uh, second is I think these states have to absolutely close all bars, probably indoor restaurants, given the size of their outbreaks, uh, any indoor gatherings, no nightclubs, none of that stuff. And then they got to keep pushing on testing. Will that be enough? I don't know. It's an honest, I don't know. Like it may not be at this point, they have let these outbreaks get so big that it may be that the only thing that stems the tide is an aggressive shelter in place order. I know there's not much political will for that, but they may have no other choice. We'll have to see, but they got to do what they can right now to try to avoid that. All right, let's turn to a more hopeful story, which is uh, up here in our part of the country. Uh, I just looked, Rhode Island's data came out about noontime today, Thursday. Rhode Island's averaging about 40 new cases a day, test positivity rate in the 2% range, hospitalizations way down, deaths are finally slowing, it seems. It looks like good news, but you're the doctor, is it? It is good news. It's great news. Look, uh, Rhode Island has done a fabulous job. Uh, I would say one of the kind of standouts in the country, a model for how we should be doing this. Uh, if the rest of the country had done what Rhode Island has done, uh, we'd be in a very different place as a nation. So uh, there are two issues here. One is to learn the lessons, and then the second is to sustain the gains, right? So one of the things that we've learned is uh, you can't rest on your laurels. You can't be like, okay, great, we're done. Uh, we got to keep going. So what does that mean? I think we have to continue to be careful. Uh, what I'm, of course, really thinking about is the fall and opening up schools. And so we've got to make sure that uh, we don't move too fast. One of the things that happened in Arizona and Texas and Florida is that they opened up way too early and then they opened up too aggressively. And so the prescription for Rhode Island and Massachusetts and other places that are doing a good job is follow the data and be careful and be ready to pull back if things start looking bad. Now, you know, we've heard so much about the fall. Uh, frankly, I, I didn't expect us to see these outbreaks in the summertime in these other parts of the country that we're seeing now, but it only reinforces the nervousness maybe about Rhode Island and Massachusetts for the fall. Is it, how should we be thinking about that? Is it that because uh, it seems like our part of the country has done such a good job lowering spread, maybe the fall won't be as bad as we feared in the past? Or are the concerns about the fall we were hearing a few months ago still basically where the experts like you are? 
I'm still pretty worried about the fall. I'm worried because, you know, one of the things that we have learned about this virus is it spreads really effectively when people are indoors. Um, now, it may be that uh, mass wearing may end up really helping us out a lot, and testing continues to be one of the strengths of this region, and, and so it may be that those two things help us a lot. Uh, but when the bottom line is, you know, November, December, it's hard to spend a lot of time outdoors. And so we're going to be indoors a lot. And I am worried about how much virus spread is going to happen. And of course, it's also flu season at that time. And so you're going to have that to contend with as well. So I remain worried about the fall, but not despondent. Like, I think we can handle it, but we're going to have to be aggressive and really on top of all of this. Schools, you were um, the hottest topic in the country, I'd say, this week, partly because of the president's comments. You've been on CNN discussing it in recent days and elsewhere. Um, it, it, you know, I, I think for parent, up here where the spread is not as bad, and Rhode Island certainly is driving toward trying to have in-person learning starting at the end of August, what we hear in the newsroom is from individual parents wondering they're not sure even how to tell if they should feel confident in the plan from their school district, in the plan for their local neighborhood school. If you're advising a parent, a friend of yours with a child in the school, what, what questions should they be asking? What should they look for to feel confident about the resumption of in-person learning? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it's actually the conversation my wife and I had this morning, uh, literally at the kitchen table about schools this fall, uh, where our kids are in school. Um, here are the couple of things that I think are, are important. Uh, first of all, um, I think let's just all agree that trying to get kids back into school this fall is incredibly important. It's really important for the kids. It's important for the parents. It's important for the economy. It's just a good thing to try to pull off, and we should absolutely try. Um, second is the single biggest determinant of whether we're going to be successful or not is how much disease outbreak there is in the community. And, and that really, that means that we've got to spend the next six weeks keeping our numbers low. If we start getting, uh, if we start celebrating a bit too much, we open up all the bars and people start really frequenting uh, indoor restaurants, I think we're going to get into trouble. And by the time September comes around, we're going to find it that, that it's hard to open up schools. The third part is really about what the schools are doing and whether they're doing a good job of thinking about social distancing, which is hard with kids, um, how we're going to protect teachers and staff, what kind of testing programs they have. All of those things will be important. To me, they are the sort of last order of business. The first important order of business is we've got to keep these communities with relatively low levels of infection. Uh, and that means I really have come to believe that if we, if we open up our bars and restaurants fully in the summer, we're going to be closing our schools in the fall. Uh, we really, that's the trade-off, and we've got to be careful about that issue. Do you think when you look at the numbers yourself for Massachusetts, Rhode Island, do you think the states are on track to be able to and again, if current trends continue, and I know that's a huge caveat, but if, if you saw the level of spread we're seeing today well into August, would you feel confident that they could try to open the schools like they want to? I do. I do. I think uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, probably about a half a dozen to a dozen states are on track to be able to do this. Uh, but one of the things I can tell you is that this stuff can move quickly in the wrong direction. So being very careful between now and September and, and really monitoring the data, there are going to be outbreaks. There are going to be hot spots, even in these states that are being careful, even under the best of circumstances. Having a plan for, to jump in wherever there's an outbreak, uh, testing everybody, isolating those cases, uh, keeping virus levels low is going to be the key issue. I'm pretty confident that a bunch of states are going to be able to do it, but, but unfortunately not the whole country, probably. So one of the reasons I was excited to have you, Dr. Chow, is because uh, you are taking over September 1st as the Dean of Brown University's School of Public Health. I know from talking to folks at Brown there, they're very excited for your arrival, and uh, it's only more salient with, with uh, public health being the biggest topic in the country right now. You're yeah. already a senior figure at one of the most... At, arguably the preeminent university in the United States up there at Harvard. Why was Brown appealing to you? Why was this a job you decided you wanted to take? Yeah, so I, I have to tell you, I'm really excited about this job uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, one is Brown is a, is a very special university. Now every university thinks they're special, but I'll tell you what, what makes Brown awesome. It is, uh, I think it, it's smaller, it's much more cohesive, it's much more multidisciplinary. So one of the things about public health is that public health affects all parts of life, and we need scholars and people from all walks of life engaged in public health. We all say that. Brown is one of the few places that really walks the walk on that. And so I think in that way, it is a very special environment. I, I'll be honest with you, there are two other factors. One is uh, the leadership of Brown, Chris Paxson, and Rick Locke. 
Uh, every time I think about a job, one of the things I, I think about is, am I going to learn a lot? Am I going to grow as a person? Who are going to be my mentors? We all need mentors. And Chris and Rick are two people that I've always looked up to well before this job came up. So uh, that's a bit of a personal reason to do it. And then the last but not least is, I think there's this incredible relationship between Brown and Rhode Island. It's not true at Harvard in Massachusetts. It's not true in the same way for almost any other school of public health and their local state. Uh, and that means that we get to be much more applied and, and kind of really test out the ideas in the real world. And so that is an opportunity that's unique. And I'm pretty excited about exploring that and, and furthering that when I get to Brown. Yeah, and of course, health director, Dr. Alexander Scott, came out of Brown, who's now one of the most visible figures in the state. I'm curious, as you think about leading a school of public health, uh, you know, you were announced Feb late February. You, I mean, people like you understood where we were headed with COVID, but people like me weren't quite sure what to make of it yet. And since then, it's all we've been talking about. How has it changed at all how you think about what the mission of a school of public health for the students, for the faculty will be uh, as you come to take over compared to maybe where your head was at when you were interviewing? Yeah, it has changed a little or in you know, meaningful ways. Let me tell you how. Um, in the past, you know, we, we often talked about, well, how do you make the case for public health? How do you explain to people why public health is important? I don't think I need to make the case for public health anymore. Like people now understand that when we mess up as a country, as a globe, mess up our public health response to a problem, when we don't invest in public health, it has huge consequences. What specifically what this means for a public health school is the hunger for knowledge about public health I think is going to explode. I think people are going to want to learn about this, understand this. And it is part of our job as public health officials and public health academics to teach the world and to, and to meet that need. And so I am really going to have to do a lot of thinking with my colleagues at the Brown School of Public Health about how do we become a place uh, that helps educate Rhode Island and the country and the world on public health issues. Second is, you know, I've been working on pandemics and, and disease responses for a long time, and I always thought that's an important area to build up. Uh, I now really feel like that's going to be an important area for the Brown School of Public Health. And, and actually, the Brown School of Public Health is, I think, ideally situated because there are so many scholars who work both on this and related topics. So I think you're going to see the school really become a national and international force on pandemics and pandemic response. So a lot of other changes are also going to happen. We're going to work through them. Uh, but it is a pretty exciting time to be you know, coming on and, and uh, helping run a school of public health. Dr. Shah, I just want to finish off with um, just a question I've been thinking about, which is, you know, uh, most of us are being good soldiers. We're wearing our masks. We're, we're following uh, the public health directives. We trust it's necessary. But there's always the hope. When will I be able to, you know, go out for dinner with my wife again, not bring a mask, go into a restaurant, not worry about the air conditioning or whatnot, just sort of live normally again? When you think about that, when could you give people some hope that they could be living their some version of their old lives again? Yeah, so I think you and your wife can go out and have a dinner indoors and largely not worry probably next summer. Uh, you know, before then, it may be possible in certain parts. It'll depend a little bit on what's happening uh, with the vaccine. But here's how I think about why next summer is probably a pretty safe bet. Uh, I think we're going to have a vaccine uh, identified, maybe more than one, probably more than one, by the end of this year or early next year. But there's also the fact that we're going to be trying to ramp up hundreds of millions of doses of, of these things. My suspicion is that in the first quarter, January, February, March, we'll still be ramping up production. People will start getting vaccinated. The vaccine won't be a magic bullet. It won't be like you get the vaccine once and you're done forever, but it'll probably be pretty effective. And a large chunk of the population will have gotten the vaccine sometime April, May, June of next year. And so it might be earlier than next summer, not much earlier than next summer. Uh, and I doubt it'll be much later. I think we're making so much progress that I am optimistic that next summer will be very different than this one. All right, we'll end on a hopeful note. Dr. Ashish Shah, we're, we're looking forward to welcoming you to Rhode Island uh, this fall, hopefully without too much COVID to go along with your arrival. Uh, thanks for taking the time to talk with us. It was such a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. We have to take a break on Newsmakers when we come back. How is Rhode Island going to close a multi-hundred million dollar deficit? And will Washington save the day? Ride Tech's Mike DBS weighs in when we return on Newsmakers. Welcome back to New 
Newsmakers, I'm Ted Nisi filling in this week for Tim White. Well, Rhode Island lawmakers are facing a massive budget deficit this year. And even though the budget year began last week, it began without a budget. They say they're going to wait to see if Washington sends more state fiscal relief that will help them close the shortfall. I spoke with the Rhode Island Public Expenditure Council's Mike DBS about what he thinks they should do and how this deficit compares to previous years. Here's our conversation. Mike DBS, good to virtually see you uh, here in your new role at RIPEC. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's ha I'm very happy to be here, Ted. So, Mike, you, uh, you have been around, uh, you've known the State House and the policy sphere for a long time. You were Chief of Staff to Governor Allman. Of course, you just finished your five years as Director of Administration for Governor Raimondo. Um, you know, for folks at home watching, they hear these huge numbers, 400, 500 million dollar deficits. It can be hard if you're not marinating in state budget figures to understand what to make of that. Can you help people in layman's terms sort of understand just how serious a budget gap we are talking about right now? Yeah, so um, one way to think of it is the revenue estimators said we were down 800 million from the November estimates, which is you know close to 20% over two years of the budget or 10% over uh, on, you know, on an annual basis, um, but that's based on growth. So we're actually only down about 300 million. It's, you know, it's government budgeting, right? So it's 800 million over budgets that have grown over two years. So it's about 300 million from the 19 budget to the 21 budget, which is, which is smaller. It's a seven and a half percent decrease, um, which is still, you know, very large because costs go up every year, but it's not, um, it's not of the magnitude that we saw in the Great Recession. Interesting, so that obviously cuts a little against some of the sky is falling rhetoric we're hearing around the budget deficit. So your view is this is significant, but we shouldn't view it as an even more outsized, you know, once in a lifetime level of deficit. Well, I don't wanna minimize it, but it's, yeah, it's not of the level, we saw a 12% drop in one year during the Great Recession on a nominal basis, so, uh, so it was much more severe than this. Obviously, the hope right now seems to be uh, that Washington will come through as the cavalry, uh, pass some sort of bill this month or next month with a lot of state fiscal relief um, for states around the country, including Rhode Island. And frankly, from a lot of the talk so far, uh, it's just wait and see what Congress ponies up before they really talk about hard decisions up there. First, do you think it's reasonable to think Congress might come up with enough money to fill the whole gap? And if not, uh, when do you think we should start to see more serious discussions about what to do? Well, I think it's reasonable to, for the policymakers to wait for the federal government. In the meantime, we're spending at the level of last year's bu uh, budget, so we're kind of at a steady state. Um, the, I think the issue is, first of all, Either, the, either it's likely we're going to get more money or they take some of the restrictions off of the money we already have so that we could actually use it to plug the budget more efficiently than we've been able to. My concern, though, is that it's one-time money and we should resist using it to actually expand our spending because we're not going to have that revenue the next year. So I think we need to get serious about curtailing our spending. Uh, as soon as possible, regardless of how much federal money comes in. And when you say that, I mean, um, you know, are you just talking about new programs that have been proposed uh, moving forward? Are you thinking that they might need to pull back on programs that are already in operation uh, to drive that down? Well, we're projecting that revenues are gonna, gonna not recover for a couple more years after this next fiscal year. So we're gonna see reductions in revenues. I think you wanna avoid uh, cuts in essential services, which would make the situation worse. Uh, you want to avoid cuts in, you know, in education and high priority programs. But I think we are going to need to pull back. And the idea of expanding uh, spending uh, from uh, this last year um, is something that I think we should try to resist. Uh, when you look at how much of this is caused by COVID, how, and how much of this is, you know, there was a big deficit projected before any of us had really heard about coronavirus. Um, you know, how much of this is driven by the current pandemic and how much of it do you think is just Rhode Island's underlying structural deficit issues? Well, we had a structural deficit, but it was not 
it was not, uh, how could I put this, not a absolute fall off in revenues. So we, we were, we were, it became customary for us to have a deficit of 100 million, 150 million in good times when revenues were going up, which actually doesn't really make much sense if you think about it, um, because it was all based on locked in growth in spending that was happening across government. Um, so we had that problem. Uh, this, is, this is on top of it. This is a very serious hit. I, you know, I have to say, I talked about the budget a little bit, but keep in mind, we're one of the hardest hit states in the country. We're, I think, uh, fifth in deaths per capita, third in cases. Uh, there's only three other states that have a higher unemployment rate last time I checked. So uh, we did have weaknesses in our economy to begin with. We have a lot of low wage service jobs. So our economy is in, in pretty, um, pretty challenging shape right now. When you, I've watched the budget process for years myself and especially the structural deficit issues. It's always seemed to me like as long as so much of the budget is healthcare and healthcare always grows, the costs go up more significantly than revenue does. It's hard for me to see how you ever get away from having a deficit every year if healthcare is going to continue to be such a big part of the budget. I mean, you know, how do you escape that vice? Healthcare is a big piece of it, and it does go up. But we also had education funding under the under the, uh, uh, the school funding formula that went up every year automatically. We had tax cuts that were multi-year tax cuts that were programmed every year. So there were a few other drivers of the budget that were, uh, you know, we had wage increases that I was involved in negotiating. So there's, there's all kinds of things in the budget that will go up, but it is, you know, it, it's in deficit speak, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different than someone who's actually suffering an actual loss year over year. You folks put out an interesting chart. You're working on a report, my understanding is about like revenue trends over time in Rhode Island. And this is a perennial fight up at the state house between the folks who say there's a spending problem, cut spending, that's the issue. And others who say Rhode Island needs more revenue to, to cover the needs of the people. And you put out a chart from this upcoming report in your newsletter that showed Rhode Island's revenue when you adjust for inflation for the rising cost of living has not actually uh, gone up in quite a few years um, because of the dip at the Great Recession and the slow recovery from there. What do you take away from that? Well, I think that we've been kind of treading water. I mean, we, we've, uh, we've expanded programs in places and cut taxes in places, but we haven't, even, we haven't actually grown the revenue pie. So it, it's probably come at the expense of other parts of government where we haven't been able to invest. We're very low in terms of capital investment. So we've had to forego certain things in that process. And, um, you know, it's, it's not a tragedy to only grow at the rate of inflation, but at the same time, we know that we've, we've expanded programs and we've, uh, uh, we've tried to um, increase the services. You know, one thing that helped us was the federal government took over uh, a large part of uh, some of the Medicaid expansion. So, um, so that was something that helped us over time. But it's, it's a, it means that we haven't grown the economy in real terms uh, because we haven't had any real large tax cuts over that period of time either. When you uh, think about, you know, looking ahead and, and where we're going with uh, this year's elections and the, the budget, what, they're going to have to decide how much borrowing to put onto the uh, ballot for voters to consider. Those almost always pass um, the bonds that are put on. You know, on the one hand, there's budget worries here. On the other hand, interest rates are pretty low. Um, what would be your recommendation of how state officials would think about borrowing and how taxpayers should think about it? I think this is the time, and this is, you know, Ryback is usually the fiscally conservative uh, voice, but I think this is the time to expand our borrowing because it's one of the few tools we have to counteract what's going to be a reduction in spending. Um, I, I'm very... Um, uh, strong and insistent that it should be for assets, capital investments, uh, not just for operating. And it should also be on things that are going to have some other value in growing the economy. So not just building things so that, um, so that people can work on those projects, which is fine, but we should think about things like educational buildings, um, expanding the internet, relieving traffic congestion. 
things like that, expanding housing opportunities. So we should, we should try to be more strategic. We should revisit the ones that have been proposed before the pandemic um, and see, you know, what's the smartest things to do. I want to thank the Rhode Island Public Expenditure Council's Mike DBAs for joining us. On the first half, we heard from Harvard University's Dr. Ashish Shah. He is the incoming dean of Brown University's School of Public Health to talk about the latest on the coronavirus pandemic and what the outlook is for schools. And if you want to keep up with the state of the pandemic in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, there's no better place to go than our WPRI.com tracking page maintained by Target 12 investigator Eli Sherman. I check it every day. Tim White will be back with us next week. But for now, I'm Ted Nisi signing off on Newsmakers.